Amen. Praise God. Well, this morning, uh, I, if Haley, if you're back there, we're going to be in the NASB uh, Bible as we uh, version of the Bible as we read Hebrews chapter 10 verses four and probably go through uh, verse 10. I titled this morning's message, A Body You Have Prepared for Me. And I want to go ahead and, and, and read this passage. And look, uh, to Haley, I just wanted to kind of give a little shout out on the, everyone that's going to work the, the scriptures back there. We don't have to put the screen black. We don't ever have to do that. Like what I'm saying is, it's not going to cause anybody confusion if we just leave the scripture up there. Because sometimes people like to view the scripture and ponder on it. So we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 4 in the NASB version. There we go. Here we go. Father, we just thank you for your precious word. Oh, hallelujah to the Lord. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. As it is written of me in the scroll of the book, when he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified. Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We thank you for your word. Sweet Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would be the preacher this morning. Lord, I yield my body to you. I yield my vessel to you. And pray that you would speak forth truth, Lord. The way you want it spoken. I pray that Matt would be crucified, Lord. That Matt would be moved out of the way. And that it would be you speaking to your people about your beloved, oh Lord. And I pray that the beloved would receive his glory through the word this morning, oh Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. I thought about putting an image up on the, on the screen of, uh, you know, you ever see those paintings where they uh, have two paintings at one and sometimes you can't really see the other hidden image, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, and I thought I had found one earlier and I was thinking about doing it, but it was just a little too much to go through. But yeah, I was thinking about an artist, and I was thinking about how sometimes even with a sculptor, how you can start off with a block of clay, right? And, and, and they'll have like the little tool, and they begin to carve away, and they knock away the edges. And it takes quite some time, or a painter even, with the brush strokes, especially if they're painting abstract art. And sometimes, though, with each stroke added, or each piece of removal slowly but surely the image starts to come to life and and I believe that that's kind of what the message this morning I want I want to be able, I want to put that in your mind and in your heart because I want to try to show you through the scripture something that God has been showing me for years and for many of you maybe you've already gotten this revelation but I, I guess it's it's regarding the big picture of God and, and it's it is regarding God's heart and what God wants his people that are called by his name to see. I can remember, and I've shared this with the church before, many years ago I was in prayer, and, and like all of us have at times, I was praying my needs before the Lord. There's a word in the Bible that says supplication. We're to bring our needs before the Lord. Amen? But a lot of times, that's kind of like sometimes all we do is we bring our needs before the Lord. I'm not saying don't bring your needs, bring your needs to the Lord. He cares, but he knows what you had need of before you even asked. Amen? But I can remember distinctly as I was praying this prayer many years ago, the Lord, the Lord told he said, son, I hear your prayer. I, I know your needs, but what about me? What about, what about what I am doing? What about my desires? And since that day, I'm telling you, it's been many, many years now, probably 02 is when that happened, that he has, I believe, methodically, progressively revealed things in the scripture to me that have made me more aware 
of what God has going on in the earth. You, you understand what I'm trying to tell you is that many people, we're so caught up, each and every one of us, we can become so caught up in the daily grind, the daily routine, yeah. right? That, that we begin to forget the fact that God is orchestrating amen. a master plan, amen? And the yeah. beauty of all of that is this, is that he has prepared such a people as this, just like he prepared Esther for what she was had to go through. He is preparing each and every every one of us. So this is part one. Part two will be more about that next week. But I want you to know that, that he has prepared a body. Amen. And, and you know, I, I was just thinking about God's plan of love and restoration and how God's plan of love and restoration reveals Jesus. It, it reveals Jesus to the lost of the world. But I got to tell you that it's not the Jesus that sometimes people think is being revealed to him. He doesn't have like these cool highlights, you know, from being in the sun so long. And hey, no, 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 that's not the Jesus that the Bible's talking about. Yeah. He's a he's a Jesus of love. He's a he's a God of love. The Scripture teaches us that God is love, and the Scripture teaches us that God commended this love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the for the ungodly. Uh, you know, the Jesus described by the prophet Isaiah is the one. You know, I think I opened it up right here. I had it open. Isaiah chapter 53. It says, it says that he has no stately form or majesty that we would look upon him, nor an appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men. He was a man of sorrows and he was acquainted with grief. And like one from men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and, and afflicted, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. It, it's not the kind, you know, in, the, in much of the church movement that we see nowadays, and I, I love to watch movements that have taken place throughout church history. That's one of my, I don't know if you call it a hobby, but it's a love that I have to study those things. And something has distinctly happened in the last decade, decade and a half. It started in California. Okay, I'm not. I'm going to be nice today. It started in California, and I'm not. Y'all heard me probably talk about it already. But where they went, and they knocked on doors in the community, and they asked the community, "What is it that we can do to make Jesus more appealing to you? What can we do to make?" To make the, the church service more appealing to you. Do we need to, you know, if you could shorten it up just a little bit. You know, if you give me like a smoke machine or some strobe lights, uh, you know, make me feel a little bit more at home. Okay. Uh, yeah, and listen, I'm not coming against, listen, whatever. I am coming against it. That's not true. Yeah. Let me be honest. <laughs> Let me be honest, because sometimes we prepare people to be more comfortable in a club setting yeah. than what we're preparing people to be in the presence of a holy God. Amen. 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 And you know, I heard a preacher say the other day, why in the world would he send his glory cloud whenever we're over here producing our own fog in the, in the sanctuary? But, but I thought that was funny. So I, that wasn't me. I wasn't that clever. Amen. But, uh, you know, but, the, but to, the world that, to the world that we live in, the real Jesus is offensive. Yes, yes. You, you understand what I'm trying to say? The real thing. Like, even in the, uh, to the untrained ear of the modern churchgoer, the Jesus yes. of the Bible is offensive. Yes, yes. He's, he's not going to make the uh, hospitality team that Jesus I just read to you in Isaiah 53 is not going to make the hospitality team in most churches. Yeah. No, we, we would prefer that you kind of just see you're a little extreme, Jesus. You and your cousin John the Baptist are just a yeah. little bit too extreme. You ruffle people's feathers and you get things going and you make it still uncomfortable. Okay, and so, but I'm here to tell you that that's the Jesus of the Bible, yes, yes. Amen. And I'm here to tell you, He is a lover of your soul. Yes. Hallelujah. And so, to the untrained ear, though, that you know, I was thinking too, the whole world is just would be so is so offended. I'm even thinking how offended they must be at God. I I asked my, Danielle this morning. I was like, what does that Peter thing stand for? Because uh, I was because some of my message comes out the Old Testament this morning. I was thinking, man, Peter would be. Peter is so offended with God. Like, what is all this? What is all this sacrifice? What is all this killing of animals? What does all this stuff even mean? This is so offensive. All this blood and all this gore. And, what, what, what is this? You know? And, 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 and you know, I was even thinking, even the children of Israel, I preached it on Wednesday. They didn't like the way God was doing stuff. 
And they're like, we're, we're loathing this manna. We want some flesh. Give us flesh. And the psalmist said that they ate quail till they vomited out of their nose. Yes, yes. Listen, there's a spiritual type for New Testament Christians in that. Many times we don't like what God's providing. So the church is so happy to try to provide something else. But this isn't how you, this isn't how you build a church, preach. I'm not interested in building a church. I'm interested in exalting Jesus. I'm interested in you and I together glorifying the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Because he is worthy. The Lamb is worthy of glory. And he's worthy of honor. But even the children of Israel, man, and I loathe this manna. And I like the way God, sometimes I haven't liked the way God's done things in my life. A lot of times I haven't liked the way God was doing things in my life. But the scripture says, you know, it does say come and see. I agree. Yeah. But also it says it's time to die. <laughs> and see, we have to learn to die in Christ. Yes. Amen. Our flesh has to learn to be crucified. Yes. Amen. And whenever our flesh is, the more our flesh is crucified, the more the real Jesus starts to show up in your life. Amen. The more the fruit of the Spirit starts to be manifest. Well, how does that even happen? Maybe somebody walked in here this morning and like, I don't even really know what you're talking about. You said the Savior's in the room. What does that even mean? Well, you know me, I use a lot of words. And by the time I'm done, you might have forgot the most important thing. But let me just say this to you. The Scripture says in Philippians 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, that the natural mind cannot perceive the things of God. Amen. You can talk to somebody all day long about Jesus, but if they're operating in their natural mind, yes, yes. they cannot understand the things of God. Right. And so in order for a natural mind to become a spiritual mind, that person must yield to Jesus. That person must yes. say, I need a Savior that died for me, and I accept Him as my Lord, and I repent of my sin." And whenever you do that from your heart, the Bible says, not just believing something in your head. The scripture says in James that the, you believe there's one God, you do well. That's one of the first scriptures my sister put on me back in the day when I, before, right when I got saved. Amen. You believe there's one God, you do well. The devils also believe that they tremble. Yes, yes. See, it's a different kind of belief. It's an entrusting of oneself, an entrusting of one's life, and a believing from the heart that says, you know what, God? I was wrong. And you were right. Yes. And I need Jesus. Yes. And I need his sacrifice to for myself. But I'm not that bad, preacher. No, we've all been born of Adam and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. No, we really are that bad in the eyes of God. We are so bad in the eyes of God. Come on, church. Somebody got to help me out here. That Jesus had to die on the cross naked. His, his body had to be broken, tattered and torn by the kind of nine tails. His head had to be thrust upon with a crown of thorns because of the curse. Okay. And so, no, it is. It is that bad. But, 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 it, but it's so beautiful that when we would yield to him and yield to his way, amen, that we would receive forgiveness of sin and a whole new life would spring up. The very thing that people were searching for. You know, the Apostle Paul, this, none of this is in the message, but <clears throat> the Apostle Paul preached in Athens. And, and when he preached in Athens, he said, I want to talk to you about that God that you didn't have a name for. Come on. His name is Jesus. Yes. And he said, the whole world is groping. That's what I think the NASB says. They're groping around. It, it, they, they, can't, they can't see. They're blindly looking for him. See, people are blindly looking for something to bring fulfillment and happiness and joy in their life. The teenage girl needs a boyfriend. The teenage boy needs a girlfriend. The, the single wife, this, I'm sorry, the single woman needs a husband. The, the single man needs a wife. All these things are, are good and they're set in order by the Lord. But, but whenever these things take preeminence over the will of God in our lives, everything goes askew. Amen. Because, see, the thing that we're really looking for, the hole that's really in there, the piece of the puzzle that makes the picture clear is Jesus. Amen. Head over heels, intimate relationship with Jesus. And if that's too strong and that's too much, th that's the best I got to offer. Yes. Is Jesus. Yes. Amen. Because you will always be looking for something else that's to right. fill the void. And I'm here to tell you. His name is Jesus. Yes. He's the light of the world. Amen. 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 There's freedom in his name. No, I come to the conclusion as I study the scriptures that God is the offended party. 
Amen. Humanity, God's creation has offended him, rejected his plan, rebelled against him. This world that you and I are living in, it's, it, it's, it's so offended with God. And, and God is so offended with it. And I'm here to tell you, my friend, if you hadn't noticed yet, the, fig, the branch of the fig tree is getting real tender. It's about to start sprouting some leaves. We are in the throes of birth pains. And I'm telling, I believe it with all of my heart. Something's shifting in, uh, on this globe. I don't think that this is, no, no, we are in the last days. Something is happening. And it's time for the church to wake up and to recognize it. And so humanity itself is, has rebelled and rejected God. But I want you to know he has a plan. Amen. He has a plan and he's included man in his plan. And he has privileged you and I with the opportunity to work with him. I, I, I've shared this with the church even recently that there's been times that I've been in ministry and I been, love me some Jesus. After he got a hold of me, long story, most, some of y'all know this story, but, but this is the thing. There's been times sometimes we allow roots of bitterness to get into our heart and we become unthankful. And lately my heart has been so overwhelmed with thankfulness, mm -hmm. gratitude. Amen. For his goodness and his grace and his mercy and the fact that he called me out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And the fact that he gave, called me as, and it's a privilege to be used by him. Amen. In ministry to be able to tell others about the goodness of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So he has a plan and he's given you and I uh, an opportunity to work with him. So in a sense, he was offended and in a sense, you got to work with me. Just, just bear with me as we work through this. In a sense, he was asked to leave the premises. Fallen man, I'm going to work, I'm going to make it clear. Fallen man, in a sense, has asked God to leave the premises. You're no longer welcome here. And it's been going on for quite some yeah. time. So in Genesis 126, let's go ahead and start with the story. It says in Genesis 126, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And look at verse 28. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it means to bring it under subjection. And have dominion. That means to rule over it. Over the fish of the sea. Over the birds of the heavens. And over every living thing that moves on the earth. And uh, you know I've been talking about this a lot lately. But the scripture right here says that God created Adam and Eve in his image and in his likeness. And when Adam and Eve were created there was no fall upon the earth. There was no sin upon the earth. And, and that their, their image and their, and, 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 you know, their likeness was like his and he has no sin in him. And had they reproduced in that state, there would have been an ongoing reproduction. Because the scripture says that, that within each creation was the seed to reproduce after its own kind. Amen. And had they reproduced in that state, the glory of God would have just filled the earth. But but then through deception, listen, you got to you got to be aware of the lies of the enemy still today because he will try to deceive you and try to tell you that there's something better besides what God has for your life. And if you believe that he will cause you to go in a direction that will bring ha havoc and chaos in your life, just like the fall did upon the earth. See, it's so, it's so clear to me. I remember one year we were teaching through the book of Genesis, and I was like, look at this. This is so beautiful. God obviously created this earth right. for, for life. I mean, he had the sun and the water here before he had vegetation. He had vegetation before he had animal life. Amen, because you got to have photosynthesis for vegetation. An animal's got to have. He created this earth for life, but it's even bigger than that. Sorry, Peter. He created it for humanity. He created man to rule and to have dominion and authority upon the earth because he created man to co regent with him and to be his, his, like a king, if you will, over the earth. But man and Adam fell, and each and every one of us, born of Adam, have fallen, and God has been offended and the creation now groans and waits for the redemption of the sons of man and something happened whenever whenever the fall took place according to Luke chapter 4 verses 5 through 8 Satan comes to Jesus 
It's the temptation, right? And this is one of the things that he says. The devil took him up and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory. He's a liar. I mean, you know, he's, he's, he lied to Adam and Eve and he's lying now to Jesus. He says, for it has been delivered to me and I give it to him to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. I'm, I put in my notes, wait, what did he say to Jesus? He said, he said that all of this belongs to me. It's been delivered to me. Yeah. Oh, how in the world did that happen? God didn't give it to him. God created Adam to have dominion and authority, but Adam relinquished his power to the liar. And, and let me tell you, that's how it happened. And, and, and I thought to myself, how offensive is that? To tell the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, how offensive is that? That God's creation now has fallen into the hands of this liar. And, but I, got, I do have good news. I've got to fast forward in the story a little bit just to remind you that in Christ there's new life. Yeah. In Christ there's new life and in Christ we regain our authority. We regain our power. See, some, some people, and listen to me, some people live in bondage to sin. Some people live under the bondage of sin. Some people sitting in churches live under the bondage of sin. Some people that are in churches have not really been changed in their outward right. life. Amen. Amen. Some people that are sitting in churches, even though they prayed a prayer, have not truly been converted. Yes. Amen. Just because you raised your hand one time and prayed a prayer does not mean that you truly were converted of the Lord. I'm here to tell you that when you do pray, with, believe with your heart, and when you do confess with your mouth, I'm talking about when you, when, you, when you believe with your heart, not just with your head, amen? But when you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, a miracle takes place. The Holy Spirit moves into your heart and He converts you, amen? You become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Praise God. And, and whenever that happens, in Christ, you regain the authority that was lost to the liar. You and I, in Christ, have power and dominion and authority. And God wants you and I to learn how to walk in that. Why? Because God's got work to do. Yes, God's got a plan that he's doing. And he's looking for people like you. And he's looking for people like me to do his work upon the earth. Praise God. That's just the truth. I read the three points to tell me how I can live my best life now. The Lord wants to give you power and authority. He wants to bless you. I believe all of that. But this is not about your best life now. Amen. It's about believing that there's an eternal kingdom to gain. Amen. It's about living your life in such a way on this side of glory. Amen. And not just for the reward, but that he would receive his reward. Amen. He's the one that we can't go through life. Just trying to gain the reward for ourselves. No, he is the reward and he deserves the reward and he deserves the reward. Amen. And that's the work of the kingdom. Yes. To make him famous. Yes. To exalt his name. Yes. For Jesus to be magnified. That's right. For him to be glorified in your life. Yes. He's done a work through Calvary that you can die to the power of sin according to yes, Romans 6 yes. and Galatians 2. You no longer have to be under the bondage of sin. He did a work on the inside of you and now the fruit of the Spirit can be manifest out of you. Amen. That's beautiful. That's powerful. I believe that. Amen. I, I have experienced that. Amen? Amen. And then you'll be walking around Oh, what happened? His name is Jesus. Yes, yes. He's the light of the world. So this physical creation, I just want you to know, it's just temporary. It's a test. That goes along with the power of the parable of the talents out of Matthew 24. We're not going to go there, but you know, he said a, a man, it's like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. <laughs> 
Now, originally, God entrusted the Jewish people with his property. But we, if you read the Old Testament, you know what happened. But listen, he said, I'm going to take it from you and I'm going to give it to a nation that's going to bear fruit. Well, he gave it to the Gentile church. Lord, help us. Yes. Now, the work of God has gone forth on the earth. But let me just tell you, now's the time. Amen. Now's the time for us to rise up. Now's the time for us to be prepared. Now's the time for us not to grow lackadaisical and become complacent. Listen, the Apostle Paul warned us that in the last days, there would be seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, that people would depart from the faith. Yes. The, the Apostle warned us that people would find heaps, they would make heaps, piles of preachers. Yes. Dude, is that not the YouTube world we live in? Now, I'm not fussing about YouTube. I found quite a few good preachers on YouTube. I'm trying to make a point. That is the world that we live in. That now we just got piles of preachers. And, and, but what it, the rest of the verse said this. That, that, because they had tickly ears. And the word in the Greek really means tell me pleasant words. And I'm just saying, most of y'all already know this. But this is where we are in the time frame. And, and listen, the, the parable of the talent said the man went on a journey. And he entrusted to his servants the, his property. And he's coming back to settle accounts one day. I, I don't know about you, but that's a sobering word for me. I mean, I know that it's the righteousness of Christ and it's his blood that was shed that makes me right in the eyes of the Father. I understand it's not my righteousnesses that are getting me in. I understand that it's his righteousness and that his righteousness is a gift, Romans 5, 17. I understand that he purchased, that it wasn't free for him and instead it cost him everything. Yes. And I understand that I don't even belong to myself. I've been bought with a price. Amen. My life is not my own. I've been bought with the precious blood of a lamb. That's right. You, if you're a Christian this morning, you don't own yourself. That's right. Somebody don't like that, huh? I, I, guess what? Sometimes I don't like it either. But Lord, let Matt die so you can live. Amen. Yes. Adam's life was a test. Our life is a test. What are you going to do with the opportunity? Amen. It's about stewardship in that in that time. So now God, if you'll, if you'll just work with me, is kind of on the outside of his creation, so to speak. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying, though. I want you to understand he positioned himself this way. He posit he per Listen, I don't think that we can understand the, the essence of how God has chosen to use man. He actually, I believe this. I mean, if you, if you, if you feel like I'm wrong in this, I'm not being wrong on purpose. I feel like he purposefully limits himself because he's waiting on man because he created this realm for man. I'm, I'm about to give you some examples here in a moment, but he positions himself this way because his purpose and plan includes us. He chose us. He purposely limits himself to partner with us in creation. He has given us authority. And let me say this. <coughs> he could have started over more than once. There's scripture that proves it. God could have started over more than once. Look at the flood. I mean, look at the flood. You and I cannot imagine the depravity and the wickedness that was going on pre-flood. And we don't, we're not going to really delve into that. But I'm just saying, if you imagine today the darkest alleys of America and the biggest streets and the depravity that takes place, in some in some of locations behind hidden doors, you, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, you, you don't want to think about it too much, but but you get what I'm saying. That's not even scratching the surface of what was going on pre-flood. The things that were happening pre-flood, the, the Lord said that wickedness was constantly on their mind. Had He not found a Noah, He would have He would have had to wipe out the whole creation. But He found a Noah. He found a Noah. See, he was looking for a man that would partner with him. And the scripture says Noah preached. Noah preached and he built. And he preached and he built. And he preached and he built. And he warned the people that judgment was coming. And I'm here to tell you, John the Baptist prepared people for the first advent of Jesus. And God's looking for some John the Baptist yes, now with the yes. spirit of Elijah. Yes. Amen. And Elijah yes. let people know Jesus, the king is coming yes. soon. Hallelujah. And, and, and he, need, he, he needed a Noah for his, in order for his plan to continue the way he wants it to work, 
He did. He needed. Now, he does not need any one of us. I don't believe that. Because, see, as soon as you and I step down, he'll fill, he'll fill the spot with somebody else. Come on. But in order for God to continue to move forward with the plan the way he originally planned it, he needed at that point in juncture someone like a Noah that would rise up, that would, that would believe him, and that would allow God to use him. Or else at that point in time, he just, he just he destroys the, their... Now, what I do want you to see is this. Can you go to Genesis chapter 8, <coughs> verses 20 through 21? I'm going to give this to you because I just want you to sing. Yes, sir. Thank you, Lord. I like to sing in the midst of the message. Hallelujah. Lord knows we need help. Hallelujah. Look at this. Genesis 8. Noah built an altar. So after the flood, it says, Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. I want you to see verse 21. It says this. The Lord smelled the, the soothing aroma. And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. Now, now listen, I don't, want to, I don't want to give anything away. But, but I don't know if you're like me. But when I read something like that. And I still, I know I've been talking about it a lot lately. Probably talking, I've been talking about it for years. It's like, why does the smell of flesh and fat... Why is that a soothing aroma in your nostrils, God? Because Peter's already mad at you. Why, why, would you, why would you do that? And I started thinking about that song. I asked Naya if she, if, to be to, to that song about the beloved. Because you see, whenever we're singing that song, at that moment in time, any of us that were able to connect to that song, we're singing it to him in such a way like he was our beloved, right? Is he your beloved this morning? I hope he is. But, but what I was seeing was something altogether different. I see the father singing that song. Because you see, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but when you see that smell, that, that soothing aroma, that sweet smelling savor, that aroma reminded him of something. That, that smell that he would smell re, reminded him of something that was coming, yes. that was on the way. And that he had a plan. And that he was sticking to the plan. Amen. Could you sing that just a little bit long about my beloved and my beloved is? My beloved is the most beautiful among thousands, among thousands. My beloved is the most beautiful. Among thousands, among thousands. Praise God. That's good. I mean, I've already given you the punchline, right? Because the next lines is the Hebrew version of Jesus, Yeshua. And we know that that's who, but, but I just want to, see, to God the Father, that's the beloved. To God the Father, that's the darling of heaven. This is God's, this is God's prize. This is the father's prize. This is how the father sees his son. And I don't know how you see him here this morning. I know I can see what the world thinks about him. Okay, but, but I'm, just, I'm just saying, like, Lord, help us as your people to cause our hearts to be lined up with yours. Synchronize our heart to you, Father, so that we would, that we would see Jesus the way that you see Jesus. Yes. Yes. That he's precious. Yes. Amen. That we would cling to him. And so he didn't only need a Noah, he needed an Abraham. Because like he said this, he said, come out of your father's house and I will give you a land and I will make a nation out of you and I will bless all the nations of the earth for you. And through your seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. And then, and then I think about Moses. See, so he needed an Abraham, he needed, a, he needed a man, he needed somebody to believe him. Well, when he said that to him, and he said, come out of your father's house, who his father was an idol maker, by the way. 
and come out of your father's house and I will make you a great nation and I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you and through your seed all nations of the earth will be blessed. And if we fast forward to AD 65, the Apostle Paul writing a letter to the Galatian church and he said he didn't say seeds as in plural as in the nation but he said seed as of one which is Christ. The whole plan was all about Jesus. The calling of Abraham I was all about Jesus. Didn't live, didn't live a wicked world and Satan ate on the other side was all about Jesus. Because the world was hurting and dying. The world needed Jesus. The world needed the love of God. I think about Moses and Exodus. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you remember the story. Moses goes up on the mountain, comes back down, and they had made golden calves, and they're over there dancing, and they're worshiping, and the Lord says, look at this stiff-necked people. Therefore, he said, leave me alone that my wrath might burn hot against them, and I might consume them in order that I may make a great nation out of you, Moses. Now, I personally believe that he was testing Moses. But you think he wasn't angry? He was angry because these people were willing to worship something. That, and so, so he said, he, he, Moses said, don't do it. Then the Egyptians are going to say this. And, but you know what Moses says in Exodus chapter 32, verse 13. Moses says this to God. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants. To whom you swore by your own self. And yes, yes. you said to them. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have promised. I will give to your offspring. And they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Yes. There was a moment in time right there. Thank God Moses wasn't all puffed up full of himself because Lord, every last one of us in this room has thought before, you know what? Probably be a good idea for the Lord to move that person out the way and I can just slide right in. The Lord knows I'll probably do a better job than them anyway. The Lord help us. Yes. Envy, jealousy, yes. malice, yes. come on, right? But, but, but thank God Moses had come to a place in his heart where he's like, no, Lord, it's about you and it's about your plan. Don't forget what you promised uh, Abraham 400 and something years ago. You promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers, that you had a plan that you were going to give them a nation. Don't you remember, God? And because, uh, because of that, God relented. Yeah. God had a purpose, a land and a nation and a people for a purpose. And, and just to remind you, I'm saying God's kind of positioned on the outside, but he's choosing to use humanity, humanity and he's sticking to his plans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want you to see in Leviticus 25, 23, because I believe that this scripture embodies part of what I'm talking about right here. <laughs> I want you to see this. It's Leviticus 25, 23. It says, the land moreover shall not be sold permanently. Look at this. For the land is mine, for you are but aliens and sojourners with me. Is that, do you ever think? <laughs> I hope when you read the scriptures, you stop and you think. Because it's almost like it seems like an oxymoron. In other words, it seems contradictory. He says, the land is mine. At the same time, you're an alien and a sojourner with me. An alien and a sojourner. A sojourner is like a pilgrim. It's like it's not really your home. Like we're on, we're on a traveling journey. Yet at the same time, God the Father created, created the earth. Right? And you know, I've thought of this before. I wouldn't go get the globe, but it would take too much time. Because I like to spin that globe around and find Israel and show you how little it is. And then you look at this big expanse of the rest of the globe and you realize, I like to, I like to say it like this. God, God found a base of operations. The whole thing was his. He created it for Adam. Adam relinquished the power of it and delivered it over to the liar. Yet God says, no, this belongs to me. And I'm just looking, I just need a man. See, because he's operating within the human vessel. Yes. I need a man that's going to believe me at my word. Yes. Yes. I'm going to give you a land. And when you give, I mean, listen, you, this may be hard for you. But I, does God, God, again, listen, I want to be clear. God does not need permission from any one of us. 
But again, if he doesn't get permission from somebody because of the way he created it, he's going to have to change his word. He's going to and he's going to have to destroy the whole thing. He's going to have to start all over again. But he's not doing that because he had a plan and the plan was Jesus. And he found Abraham. And Abraham was willing to believe it. And so there he is. I'm coming in and I'm taking this. I'm taking this. And he's telling Israel, don't you sell the land. Now, if I choose to take it away from you, like, like he did in AD 70, whenever General Titus of the Roman army raised Jerusalem and knocked it down to the ground. I don't know. We probably don't know that song. Like, you give and take away. Job said that in Job chapter 1 verse 21. He's the guy that gives and takes away. Yes. And God says, if I choose to take it away from you in AD 70, I will. And if I choose to give it back to you in 1948, I will. And if I choose to do what I choose to do, then I will do it. Amen. He's the God that gives and takes away. Yes. My heart will surely say, uh, blessed be your name. Amen. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Yes. Praise God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Whether he gives, whether yes. he takes away. Yes. Blessed be your name. Yes. Oh, Lord, because you're worthy. Hallelujah. Amen. He said, but here I go. I, I got this strip of land because I got a plan. I want you to see this. It's like it's like when we, we use Saudi Arabia to fly sorties against Iraq back in the day. Some of y'all weren't even born yet. It's like God's like, I'm about to mount an attack. Upon the forces of evil, I have a plan. I'm about to, I'm about to mount an attack on Satan and his kingdom. He told Peter later. He said, "On this rock, on the revelation that you speak, uh, my Father in heaven gave you this revelation that you are the, you are the Christ, the Son of the Living God. And upon this rock, this truth, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it." But hallelujah! But I need a I need a man to believe me so that I can start with this piece of land. Yes. And now that I gave this promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, don't you sell my land. That's why I love the story of Naboth and Jezebel, but we don't have time for that. Naboth said, God forbid that I sell my father's land yes. to you. Boy, that's just like the devil, huh? He wants you to give up your property. He wants you to give up your, your title deed. He wants to destroy you. He wants to deceive. Don't open the door to the devil, That's my friend. Right, I'm telling you right now, if you open the door to the devil, he's going to come in. Yeah. I'm not, there's, there is restoration. Hallelujah. There is forgiveness. And thank you, Jesus, for the ministry of reconciliation. But I'm telling you right now, you don't want to open the door to the devil. He'll start stealing and killing and destroying. Yeah. Yes, he, will. he said, the land is mine. It's not to be sold permanently. He said, he said don't mess up my covenant I made with Noah. Don't mess up my covenant I made with Abraham. Don't you mess up my agreement with Moses. I almost destroyed you. <laughs> Don't sell my property. It belongs to me right now. But we're strangers in the land together. Because see the world doesn't want him in his own property. And Jesus said if they hate you. Remember that they hated me first. Because you see that Peter said that you're a stranger too. Peter said you're a pilgrim. You're a pilgrim in the land. The great Hall of Fame of the witnesses of Hebrews chapter 11. Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Even the, the architect of the city that Abraham was looking for was God. He wasn't looking. He never even saw the promises fulfilled. But he had so much faith, he bought a piece of property, a cave, just so he could bury his wife. Because he said, I know that the Lord gave this to me. And the Lord came through on his promises. <laughs> and then right there in the fullness of time in the land that he told them not to sell, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, Galatians 4.4. Hallelujah. Because you see, I had a plan. My enemies, pre-flood, tried to destroy the plan. By messing up the seed of the woman. We're not going to get into that right now. But I did what I had to do to destroy that plan. And now I'm moving forward. I have a plan. And here he comes forth. And so here we are in the scripture. In Hebrews chapter 10. Back in the NASB version if we can. That we read before we got started. You see where I was bringing you now? That God has a plan. 
And then finally on this day, it came to pass. See, we don't have time to really break it down like it deserves to be broken down. But in Hebrews chapter 10, whenever it says a body you have prepared for me, it's actually quoting the psalmist is actually prophesying that about Jesus, that the, that a body would, was being prepared for Messiah. Does, does that make sense? In other words, the psalmist spoke way back in 1000 BC and he prophesied a body you have prepared for me. And what that was talking about was Jesus. Amen. That he would one day come. Because God has a plan. So in, in starting in verse 4 of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 4, it says, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired. Now, I just wanted to stop right there for a second because I don't know about you, but I know that the cat's out the bag already, but there's no reason to keep people in anticipation. But it's like, well, what about the sweet smelling savor? What about your food, O oh Lord? I mean, it says it in Numbers chapter 29. You will prepare food for me upon my table. There will be food for me. And it was sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. Numbers 29 describes annual sacrifices. There's the Passover. There's the Day of Atonement. There's the Feast of Trumpets. There's the, the Feast of Booths. Man, let, let, let me just read that one to you. The, 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 Numbers chapter 29. You don't even have to turn there, Haley. It's okay. Let me just read it to you real quick. Numbers 29. For the Feast of Booths. Listen to this. On the 15th day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. That means a Sabbath. You shall not do any ordinary work. You shall keep a feast to the Lord seven days. You shall offer a burnt offering, a food offering, with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Look at this. Thirteen bulls from the herd. Two rams. Fourteen male lambs, a year old. They shall be without blemish. And their grain offering, a fine flour mixed with oil. Three tenths of an ephah for each of the 13 bulls. It goes on and on. He says also one male goat, verse 16, for a sin offering. Besides the regular burnt offering. There were, so, so this was an annual. Then every new month they came, they had to offer up sacrifices. Then weekly on the Sabbath, they had to offer up sacrifices. And then every single day at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., they had to offer up whole burnt offering sacrifices. And the scripture goes on to say, in each one of these, it says, and it will be a sweet smelling aroma. Yeah. So whenever I read this scripture and, 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 and the psalmist says, he says, sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, you do not desire. And I think to myself, but, but Lord, what was it all about? You're sitting here repetitively having them offer up these sacrifices. And then whenever you get to Isaiah chapter one, verse 18, I'm just trying to show you the heart of God. I'm trying the best that I know how to show you the heart of God because I'm trying to show you through the Old Testament that God has a plan and he's the same God since yesterday, today, and forever and that he doesn't change his mind. And then he's been having a plan and the plan is Jesus. The plan is Jesus. Amen. And if we get outside of Jesus, we're messing some stuff up, my friend. And it's the, it's the Jesus of the Bible. He says in verse 18, he says this, Come now, let us reason together. Isaiah 1, 18. Isaiah 1 and 18. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And I see... In this passage of scripture, he goes on to say this. Who has told you to bring these vain offerings before me? And I'm thinking, well, Lord, you told your people to do these offerings. You're the one that told them to do yearly sacrifices, monthly sacrifices. He said vain. He said vain, empty. There's no meaning to them. Do you understand that we can still walk up in a church in modern day New Testament Christianity and punch the God clock and we just sit down and we're like, okay, I'm paying my dues. Jesus died for me, so now I'm going to go ahead and pay my dues. Get me in in an hour, lickety split, preacher, or else I'm going to have a problem. And we'll go find a place that will. Yes. Come on. 
Help me out here. No, he's worthy of our glory and our honor, my friend. He's worthy to be worshipped and he's worthy to be adored and he's worthy to be thanked. And God says, don't bring this vain worship before me. God wants our heart. He wants our heart to be connected to his heart. He says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. Praise God. He says in verse 9, Behold, I have come to do your will. Isn't that good? Yeah. Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. Thank the Lord yes. that Jesus, the obedient one, came to do the will of God. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. Aren't you thankful that you don't have to go get a, get a goat from your herd? We look. And Wena would be busy. Because she don't only want in here with goats. I don't know. She'd have to have a whole lot more because we'd be going over there. And we'd have to, unless your heart was hard like Cain. And you're like, oh no, I got some vegetables. I'm going to bring that to the Lord instead. No, no, that's not going to work. We'd be, we'd be having to knock on that Wena's door. Can you got, let, let, me, let me buy moth from you. And she's like, no, that's my favorite one. <laughs> that's the name of one of her goats. So. Aren't you glad that we don't have to go through that process? Yeah. No, Jesus, see, he came, he came to, to take away the first so that he could establish the second. Hebrews talks in that same chapter about the fact that all of those priests never sat down because there, every year there was a constant reminder of sin. A constant reminder with all of those sacrifices over and again, over and again. But this, Jesus, after he offered himself as the sacrifice for sin, he sat down. He sat down because his work was complete. There was no more sacrifice needed. It's a finished work. Praise God. Now I and the team, if y'all could come back up. If you could go to Isaiah chapter 6 for me, I'm going to just close with that. And then we're going to worship the Lord. And as always, the altars are open. I love this passage of scripture in Isaiah. It says in the year that King Uzziah died. I love, you know, if you study the name Uzziah, it, it means strength. In the day strength died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne. A lot of times we don't see the power of the Lord. A lot of times we don't see God's power working in our own life like we want to because we're still operating. Look, this is a message for the preachers. We're still trying to operate in our own strength. You can just play those keys softly. He said, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne. He was high and lifted up. And the train of his robe <coughs> filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Burning angels is what they're described as. And each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You know, whenever Jesus died, the Bible says that the, Bible, the, the, the veil in the temple was ripped from the top to the bottom. And that it showed that access into the presence of God was, was made. When Isaiah entered into the presence of the Lord, what he realized was that he was unclean. If you're covered in the blood of Jesus, now you're clean. You're not going to get any cleaner than that. 
Even still, though, when you get into the presence of the Lord, I don't know about you, but my heart just gets really soft. I'm so thankful. You know, maybe you're here this morning and you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior. I just want to at least tell you what that means. It means that you would open up your heart. You would say, Jesus, I need you. You know, a lot of times we do a big we, we do a big deal where we want people to come to the altar. I'm here. If you want to repent of your sin, I'm here to pray with you. Amen. But I can tell you one thing. You can do business with God on the side of your bed. You can do real business with the Lord on the side of your bed. And you can be business with him. And if you'll open up your heart, crack your chest, and be like the psalmist and say, search my heart, try my reins, meaning check out the inside of me, Lord. Forgive me, for I have sinned against you. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Amen. Come into my heart, Lord. Forgive me of my sin. If you'll pray that and mean it from your heart, I'm, we're going to know you guys say, my friend. <laughs> because it's going to be all over your face. And you can give a testimony. And you'll start worshiping the Lord like he deserves. Praise God, and you'll start growing in Christ. As long as, as, long as you keep growing in, in the Word and you're growing in the Spirit, you'll keep growing in Christ, and God is going to change you day by day, minute by minute. He's going to have His way with you. Call on the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Would the rest of you stand with me this morning? Can we worship Him?